Okay, uh, so it's a pleasure to be here uh, at this workshop. And uh, Chris invited me to talk about uh, museums. So museums are obviously one way in which um, the public interact with paleontology. I'd say it used to be that that was the main way that people would, you know, the general public, if such a thing exists, experience paleontology at museums. Today, I'd say there's much more exposure, perhaps through uh, news articles, blog posts, etc. But museums are kind of the ones which are the least transient. So they're the ones which are there for the longest period of time, uh, and the ones that people, most people, say if you think about school children, and we kind of say in museums that, that we get people when they're children, and then we get people when they have children. So most people don't visit museums a huge amount. So the other 97% is kind of making the most of underwhelming fossils uh, in museums, but also uh, the other 90% of kind of paleontological knowledge. Uh, and many of you may recognise this very famous uh, image by an up-and-coming paleo artist of uh, is, it inter is it interesting to us not yet? So this is a kind of a composite of less interesting fossils who have got together to try and make themselves look like something more interesting. But of course their fatal error is they've gone for a Stegosaurus, which is kind of the D-list of, uh, of interesting dinosaurs at best. So thinking about museums, um, obviously there are permanent displays and then there are exhibitions. And paleontologically, uh, the exhibitions, mostly from the larger museums because they can afford it, uh, are often on kind of six different themes. So sometimes you have uh, kind of the Ice Age fauna, mostly includes mammoths, maybe woolly rhino. This is me and colleagues enjoying ourselves at the recent Natural History exhibition. So that's one kind, as you'll hear about Ice Age fauna, probably mammoths. Then you've got dinosaurs, of course, uh, and then you've got dinosaurs, and then you have dinosaurs again. And you have dinosaurs again. So these are all recent uh, examples of the Natural History Museum in London's touring exhibitions. So these are pretty much all the paleontologically themed uh, touring exhibitions. And then occasionally you get some of this nonsense uh, and it kind of sets, you know, nobody goes to these human uh, evolution uh, exhibitions and so they cycle right back around to Ice Age mammals and dinosaurs. So this is kind of what people are being exposed to. I think we're trapped, museums are trapped in a, in a cycle uh, of kind of reusing this content because uh, really paleontology, when it comes to paleontology, natural history, dinosaurs in general have become synonymous with not just natural history museums, but museums in general. So uh, I talk to colleagues in other museums, and particularly people who work for kind of visitor services, be it at the v or the British Museum or the Science Museum, one of their number one questions is, where are the dinosaurs? So people just think it's a museum, there must be dinosaurs, they want to go and see them. But of course it's a, a cycle, so people only want to come and see the dinosaurs, but of course when most of our exciting new content is dinosaurs, they're not really going to expect um, anything else. Uh, and of course the other problem with museums is their time scales. So by the time, unlike perhaps art museums, where their exhibitions are genuinely updating the scholarship, so the catalogue that goes along with it will be updating whatever, Rembrandt attributions or uh, whatever the theme is, in natural history museums it's not really updating the scholarship, so you know, papers will be written, uh, and then by the time a museum gets together with putting together an exhibition touring programme, buying in some animatronics or new specimens, um, those uh, kind of interesting findings are no longer interesting, no longer relevant, uh, have been solved, uh, and that's why we end up with some content which is kind of around non-traversies. Uh, so, you know, by the time these exhibitions are coming out, um, it's really quite behind um, the current science. Despite all this, museums are still trusted authorities. So despite all we do to, to kind of undermine this, uh, they are still trusted authorities. Uh, and around the time that we were all groaning, audibly groaning, uh, this article came out, which I think most people read, uh, where somebody said, okay, all these paleontologists, including people in this room, whinging back to us, well, let's go and have a look at the Natural History Museum and spot the inaccuracies. And of course, as we all know, there are many, as there are in museums across the world. Uh, so we're still trusted authorities, people still come to us, even though we're quite behind, uh, can be inaccurate, and we like to use the well-worn path. So these kind of easy go-to phrases that aren't particularly scientifically accurate and don't necessarily mean anything. So this is museum talking about missing links still, living fossils still, so these really easy phrases that, you know, if you're talking about, uh, if you're talking about the Nautilus or if you're talking about uh, some other kind of thing that's described as a living fossil, I can't think of a single organism at the moment, um, then it's easy to say these are living fossils, despite the fact that most people don't know what the phrase living fossils means, and living fossils doesn't mean what we think it means. So it's, it's a nonsense concept. We should just say nothing rather than say it's a missing link or a living fossil. It's already been mentioned. We also have people like uh, Mary Bloody Anning, I've called her here. So, you know, the most uh, biographied, promoted uh, research 
forgotten scientist there ever was. There are many more other forgotten scientists, there are many more other forgotten female scientists, yet uh, through the media, through museums, we still keep talking about these same old characters, and the same goes for uh, Alfred uh, Russell Wallace and other people like that. Uh, and really, museums kind of have a low standing across the science sector. So there's this report called uh, Geology for Society, published by uh, the Geological Society, and the word museums does not enter this at all. Neither does outreach, neither does fossil festivals, neither does all that, that stuff that Chris was talking about. So it's not seen as, we're not seeing as having an impact in geology for society, despite the fact that most of us would kind of say the reason we got into this was because uh, of something we saw uh, at a museum or a fossil festival or a fossil hunting trip. So it's not because geoengineering is important to water quality uh, or you know, rare and precious metals and, and minerals. So museums don't really kind of, they're not really coming onto the agenda of people who think would be saying this is a huge area of geology for society. Directly linked there, we're talking to people, it's cultural. And so I mentioned earlier uh, the problem with kind of dinosaurs being the main output and becoming synonymous with a natural history museum. And so this question will be perhaps the second most common question that people ask in a natural history museum, particularly children. So the first one is, is it real, always? And the next one is, is it a dinosaur? And, uh, and anything that is in a natural history museum, especially if it's an articulated skeleton, is automatically a dinosaur, particularly for younger people. And you know, when you listen to museum visitors, their children will say, is it a dinosaur? And the parents will go, yeah, you know, nodding at a camel, a horse, a giraffe, uh, whatever it is. Because it's a skeleton, it's a dinosaur, museums are synonymous with them. Of course, if you think about museum collections, if you think about paleontological knowledge in general, uh, dinosaurs is just one part of it. So what about the other 97%? Well, it's realistically more the other 99%. So this is the collections that we have. So as you all know, it's less than 1% of collections are normally on display. It's not the stuff that's made up, uh, that most, makes up most of the museum collections. And uh, the normal line from museums is that this stuff is for researchers, behind the scenes research. But actually, for those of us who work in museums, we know that actually vast swathes of the paleontological collections don't receive visitors. So we rarely see, receive mollusk visitors. We rarely receive people to have a look at the raptorite collections. So what can we do about this kind of other 99% of knowledge and specimens, which tend to look a bit like this? Actually, this one's quite a nice example. Um, well, the way it's done in kind of public displays are uh, displays like this, right, inspiring nobody since the 19th century. Uh, and you see these displays in museums all over the world. So you'll probably recognise some of these. We've got the Natural History Museum, British Fossils Gallery. We've got uh, the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. Kind of thematic displays around the wall. This is the National Museum in Prague, and that's the Taylor Museum down the bottom there. So just this kind of stuff that's put in a case, uh, bare interpretation, maybe something about the, the kind of different uh, periods that we're going through, maybe arranged taxonomically, maybe you've just got a kind of uh, scientific name that's probably wrong uh, or out of date. Uh, and we just seem to be stuck into this kind of 19th century uh, mode of displaying the rest of paleontology. And if you think this is kind of an old practice or just displays you haven't got around to updating, this is a very cherry picked bit of the Natural History Museum's collaboration with uh, the Google Cultural Institute that was kind of launched yesterday, I think. Um, and so this is how an element of their digitised collections are presented. So you can see almost exactly the same as these. Uh, and uh, you know, this, this top one here, uh, I don't imagine anybody who will start a lifelong collaboration or a lifelong passion for paleontology uh, from that one single specimen there. So we really struggle to do anything interesting uh, with things which aren't kind of obvious or things that we haven't done uh, uh, over and over again. So I'm going to talk a little bit about something that I did in my museum career uh, to kind of change that. So when I was at the Grant Museum of Zoology at UCL, um, we had a huge collection of fossil fish, semi-important, and it was associated with people like DMS Watson, but in reality nobody had really come, apart from one research group that had come to look at eight fossils in the 10 years that I was there, nobody had come to see this collection. So what do we do with this, this kind of collection? Uh, how do we interpret it? We can't make it interesting in that obvious way. You know, these hoplopteryx is not doing particularly interesting things um, for us to talk about. So we started this blog series for Grant Museum called Underwhelming Fossil Fish of the Month. And the aim was basically all I was attempting to do is to give the dull fossils a bit of time, encourage people to kind of think about them maybe tell a friend about them and together we'll increase the global fish, this fish to receive one fossil fish at a time. So the idea was, you know, and it's a little bit naughty, 
was to, instead of uh, the usual museum line saying these are all fantastic, wonderful things, everything we have in the collection is amazing, perfect, and perfectly documented, was to try and highlight some of these collections which just aren't. So kind of ask the question, why do we have this? Thank you. Why do we have this? Uh, what's the history of it? When was it last looked at? So very broadly, uh, it's quite easy to any drawer you open, find a boring fossil fish, uh, and basically start from the top left and keep working through every month. Uh, and kind of had a breakdown of the specimen history, so where does it come from? Nine times out of ten, we don't know, or from Asia, or something like that. Uh, the preservation, comment on the preservation of it, the scientific research into the species and the specimen, and then the wider cultural impact on society for most of these things. It's nice, so that's where we have to make some stuff up. Uh, and it wasn't just a kind of very dry presentation of these things, it was spiced up with kind of uh, nonsense really, in a way to try and keep people <laughs> reading and looking. So we had a, a find the fossil section, so this is one of the other boring fossil fish a month, which is really because the actual fossil is first in. Uh, we've got some dodgy paleo art, uh, and then you know, kind of tying into what if we remade uh, films around uh, these fossil fish because they were slightly nicely preserved, and then even kind of taxing with choose your own adventures for names where basically nobody had nobody really bothered to correct the names since the 19th century. Um, so some of this as well as the scientific content, and um, that was a, it seemed to be a really, really good thing. So taking a couple of hours a month to write those, and so it led to kind of lots of other things. So uh, it led to a live show, so there's a, a, a small set about underwhelming fossil fish. Uh, various uh, kind of media organisations got in touch to, to focus on these boring fossil fish, and that was great, so that was motherboard, I think. Museum practice got in touch, so lots of that kind of, um, you know, how do you make boring collections exciting? So I got quite a few bits of interest there. And eventually ended up you know, talking about fossil fish uh, on radio for Insight Science, uh, a paper for Paleontological Association, and then other museums like here, kind of underwater fossil fish would pop up. So taking initially a collection which is you know, useless, unusable, don't worry about it, don't worry about documenting it, to something that the museum was then known for, and an interest, albeit an interest in how uninteresting some of these things are. Uh, and I'm very happy to report that this summer we just wrapped up filming this uh, film, Fishery, the Untold Story of the Stockholm School, about uh, the Stockholm School of Fish Paleontologists in uh, Scandinavia and their exciting contributions to fossil fish uh, paleontology. Um, of course, this never happened, but it's on the cards. Uh, so thinking about this, and of course this is one approach, we can't all be doing you know, underwhelming fossils in the collection, but just by thinking a little bit creatively, changing slightly um, how we talk about paleontology, uh, it kind of opens up interest and so we get out of this cycle that we're stuck in uh, and we've got such a wealth of kind of tools and technology to enable that so it's not necessarily just through exhibitions we've got the podcasts we've got 3d printing etc etc occasionally we kind of do break our own rules so when the tully monster research came out last year and um, that was one example where you know as all the scientists all the science writers we just decided to ignore the traditional rules about what's interesting or not uh, and so, you know, this story was reported by uh, uh, news agencies and museums all over the place. Uh, again, it's quite, it's, it is interesting, and it's like, okay, well, when, when are we going to see these kind of things in displays, in exhibitions? Um, you should try and make sure that stuff like this isn't just that transitory, you know, I don't think anybody now out there knows what Tully Monster is, but for those couple of hours during that week, everyone was thinking about, or exposed to Tully Monster in any case. So how can we translate these kind of things more and more into museum practice and get away from the, the kind of usual, uh, the usual things. Think about impact in museums, and this one's really uh, important. So actually, we're kind of a weird group of people in this room because very few people go to museums regularly. So most people may go to a naturalist museum maybe once a year. Uh, they probably won't go to more than one naturalist museum a year. Um, they probably won't be like us, who probably spend half our time in museums, visiting museums or talking about museums. And it's very interesting because we don't get this kind of feedback. So this is feedback on, on uh, some Guardian articles. So despite the fact we're told not to read the comments, uh, sometimes you do, or sometimes your family send them to you and say, this person was very rude. Um, and again, because you've got this huge audience, um, so you know, people, the hits go from like 100,000 uh, down to perhaps five, ten thousand. 10,000. Uh, and you get this massive scope between people who you know, think, or may, well, know it all, uh, and uh, cannot empathise with perhaps other people not knowing everything that they know, through to people saying, you know, uh, this fossil is, I wasn't aware of what this was, this was a great article. 
this song I'm going to read out, it's not very nice, it's pretty friendly. This one I'm going to say, this is great, but I didn't know that octopuses were mollusks. It's really, really hard. We've got a huge, huge range, generally, um, to, to try and address, and how can we address that through some of the stuff we'll be talking about later. Thank you. Um, one thing in general with the way that we do exhibitions and interpretation in museums is we're really, really still using this 1850 model um, uh, of communicating um, paleontology, going all the way back to the Crystal Palace dinosaurs. So, okay, we might have a bit more of an earlier section talking about Ediacara, and we might have a bit of a later section talking about human evolution, but in general we tend to, to, to talk about this narrative it's always a progression up towards humans, and we only ever talk about the most interesting animals that are around at that time. So as soon as other things come along, we stop talking about whatever ammonites and fish, because more interesting things like uh, tetrapods are around, and then dinosaurs turn up, so we stop talking about all other kinds of animals. And we still, even in things like textbooks, even how we visualise, again, this is from the US um, the same old story, this progression, very much telling our evolutionary history, not necessarily the evolutionary history of life, which is quite limiting. The other thing is creativity. So, in general, I would just like a lot more creativity, uh, and it seems to be something that we were hugely creative in the 19th century. I think it's because we had a bit more uh, resource, uh, a bit more vested interest in it, uh, and also there's much higher status being associated with the museum. So the leading scientists would have been at the museum, whereas today that's not necessarily the case. There's still some great colleagues in museums. And so that's how we still end up with, uh, I still see them, but I couldn't find an image that I could use. We still find tree-licking giant sloths. And that goes right the way back to, you know, when their first description, their first recovery. We see it here in the Starlight's Plastic Models, we see it in the Natural History Museum. Uh, the fourth slide of this, without kind of crediting worries, is just, just a wall of tree-licking sloths. So we're kind of stuck in this, uh, in this um, mode and we're stuck with the 19th century examples that we use. We don't really talk about anything new. So where are you know, the kind of interactive diplograxis uh, things on galleries? Where's the kind of dioramas of uh, Climacoceros rutting or whatever? Uh, or you know, solute play sets or you know, Camaroceros dress up for children or, or whatever it may be. Or leads it this scale models. We don't have any of this at all. We fit into these really, really conservative same things over there. One new development in the way we try and interpret collections is this very successful history of the blah in however many blahs. So history of the world, <laughs> uh, and this really kind of um, has been hugely popular, kind of it was really popularised by the British Museum's approach to history of the world of 100 objects, and now there are hundreds and hundreds of these. It really speaks to kind of the listicle and the, the kind of short attention span, coffee book kind of thing. You're not really going to learn anything by, by just picking these things up, but this seems to be an easy, marketable, attention span capturing things. We're seeing this a lot more uh, in museum output. Again, this is fresh from the Naturalist Museum uh, Google Cultural Institute collaboration. And occasionally there are museums doing some interesting things um, with it. So this is from the uh, Royal Belgian uh, Institute in, oh, sorry, got that wrong. Royal National Institute in Belgium. Uh, and there's a whole, there's this very small selection in the famous of kind of speculative evolution. So this is an animal that does not yet exist. Um, and they had, I think they had some kind of crazy uh, flying lemurs. Uh, and that was really, really interesting, uh, but very subtle. So it's just kind of alongside the fossils. So again, people were going around saying, well, look at that interesting animal, not realizing that it was completely made up theoretical animal. Because you have to read the labels, and nobody reads the labels. Through to some of this stuff uh, from my museum. So, you know, oh, a nice dictodon. And I know that they do get used every now and then. But seeing a nice reconstructed one, or think about shrewdly that, think about concepts that. <coughs> So a little bit more of this, a little bit more uh, creativity and kind of breaking the mould and really getting away from these 19th century stereotypes and we'll be hearing a lot over the next two days about where we can be inspired by this. If paleo art, for example, at the moment uh, is just so creative and interesting, so how can we translate those into museums? How can we scare the pants off of children so they never forget Tanistrophius uh, rather than you know, sad old animatronics of dinosaurs? And one last thing uh, for anyone watching out there, we definitely need more angry cephalopods in our galleries. Uh, we're very late to say thank you very much.